Let us now welcome our next guest, Keith Ellison, Minnesota Attorney General since January of 2019. He was a member of Congress, you know, representing Minnesota's 5th Congressional District through 2019. He was on the House Financial Services Committee for a dozen years, and that's a committee with responsibilities for housing, for financial services, and a lot of other important things. Last summer, he brought a new focus to addressing problems in the healthcare industry following a series of complaints about predatory practices at a large in state healthcare firm. Attorney General, thank you for coming. You've been working on the, uh, oh, there it goes. You know what I do for a living, right? I repeat words that other people put in my ear. That's my job. So without this, what would I be? Talk to me about the solution that you're really excited about that will help with medical debt in the state of Minnesota if it gets passed into law. The Medical Debt Fairness Act is what we're trying to pass mm -hmm. right now. This, this bill... Uh, is a few pieces. One is medical debt, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The other one is connected to medical debt, and that is uh, with regard to garnishing your pay. And the third uh, has to do with uh, certain certain aspects of levy and execution. In Minnesota, they can literally zero out your entire account. Uh, other states leave you some money uh, to survive on, uh, and of course, we're going to we need to update what is not. Uh, takeable uh, things like family Bible, things like that, which should be religion neutral. It should be more inclusive. But medical debt, you know, this is the debt that you and I don't ask for. If you you didn't ask to get cancer, if you went up on your roof to try to fix it and you fall off of there, you weren't expecting to hurt yourself that day. Uh, you know, so many aspects of medical debt are things that are surprised and we don't have any chance to shop for. And so we believe that, yeah, we, we should pay our debts. We believe that. But we also believe that this, we've got to have fairness. We believe we've got to have transparency. And if we pass the uh, Debt Fairness Act, we will be able to make some very significant advances in that area. Uh, should I talk about some of the features of it? Well, let me ask you about a couple yeah. of them, in fact. Yeah. Uh, what's, I didn't fully understand this. If a spouse were to die, right. the other spouse is responsible for the debt? The debt switches over to the to the survivor. Why is that? Because the Minnesota State Legislature years ago was influenced by people with a lot of influence, and they, they said that's the way it's going to go. So would the act address that? Yes, it would. It would ban that practice, and we wouldn't do that anymore. We also would say that uh, you couldn't be denied non-emergency care if you have an outstanding balance. Uh, so that happens. So oh, yeah. someone shows up and they're, they're in need. And they said, well, you got some debt. Yeah. Well, you mentioned a case that I had intervened in uh, a few months ago, and that's exactly what the problem was, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, one of, I mean, the good news is that Alina doesn't do that anymore, but they were. And so, uh, you know, uh, th that's, uh, that's part of what was going on. We're glad they don't do it. We're proud they don't do it. But we, uh, we engaged them around the issue. And, and so nobody would be able to do it anymore. And, you know, actually my predecessor years ago – was able to get into uh, some voluntary agreements with a number of hospitals around the state to stop that practice, but still we caught some of them doing it anyway. And uh, so now we're trying to codify this practice into law to say that if there's an outstanding balance, you can't deny people emergency care. Also, you can't report a medical debt to a credit bureau, right? So because you didn't ask for this debt, it isn't really not an indicator of your creditworthiness because it's accidental and random, and then limit uh, in, uh, the interest rate on medical debt. Now the cap is like 8%. It should be much lower than that. Uh, and so these are a number of things that that, bill, that that bill would do, and it's working its way through the legislature. So, folks, if you think this is a good idea, please call your state legislature. <laughs> we definitely could. Uh, they could use a little bit of inspiration and encouragement. <laughs> well, I mean, let me let me take what you just said and, and, and put a little bit more edge to it. You are one of the most seasoned observers of Minnesota politics. Does it have a chance? 
It has a very good chance. It's been making a lot of rounds. So we have deadlines in Minnesota state legislature. So bills have to make a deadline, and the deadline's coming up fast. But we think we will, and uh, we're hoping that and we're, we're hoping that we do when we have every reason to believe this bill will become law. But the chances increase if you call your state legislator. Mm-hmm. And, and, we're, the, and by the, the way, we're going to have a debt. We're going to have a debt fairness on the Hill Day on April 15th. Please come on out and join us. And the governor's on board, lieutenant governor? Lieutenant governor, governor. Both of them spoke so eloquently along with Minnesotans who came forward and told their stories. One of them told a very heart-rending story. Uh, about how uh, he was saddled with a lot of debt because his wife had cancer, terminal cancer, died. Uh, Because of a great group called Cancer Legal, they were able to intervene and help him sort that out. But he was looking at about $150,000 debt. Mm. And then there was another woman who came forward and talked about how there was a coding dispute and a medical coding dispute and how that dispute amount uh, basically has her facing about a quarter of a million dollars in medical debt. And, and this is all because of a dispute, and they're st- but they're still going after her. They're still trying to collect that money, and we want to be able to fix those problems. Why is Minnesota fighting this battle? I mean, how do you see federal policy play into this? I know, like, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau takes interest in medical debt and Federal Trade Commission and so forth. Well, yeah, we're so glad for our state partners caring about this. But here's the thing, you know, my, my, when I, you and I know each other from way back, yeah. and, uh, you know, when I left Congress and ran for... Minnesota State Attorney General, I ran to help people afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. And so pocketbook issues are what I'm all about. And so this is natural for us to try to deal with this medical debt. This is something that unites all of us. Maybe even the burden is greater in greater Minnesota, certainly greater on certain communities of color. And this is something that pulls us all together. So we're doing it in Minnesota because in Minnesota, we believe we have to have an economy that works for everybody. But we're looking for federal help everywhere we can get it, mm-hmm. and we're glad. I think the gu- the president cares about it, and certainly the the CFPB does as well. By old friends uh, on my PBS show, we did a story about uh, the mortgage mess. We walked through North Minneapolis neighborhood together with cameras, and I looked at the date of this coverage. It was it went on the air November of two thousand seven. Right, the crisis was later. So tune into public media. We'll <laughs> keep your eyes open here. We were ahead of our time, David. Yeah, sadly, right. <laughs> All right, some questions from Zoom. Beth, thank you for sending this in. This is helpful. Um, it it actually adds some juice to what I was just asking you. Uh, Beth wanted to know: Can states make progress on this without federal legislation? Do you need a little bit more backstopping from federal legislation? Absolutely, yes. We can. We're not preempted here, and we can certainly regulate in this area. And if we get this bill passed, we're going to make a big difference in the lives of Minnesotans. Uh, but we do need federal help, though. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't just because the states can operate independently here doesn't mean that they should. We do mm-hmm. need more federal action, and I think this uh, particular uh, administration cares about this. But you know, the fact is, states can operate. Uh, we can we can go after it. We can regulate. We're not preempted. Lois on Zoom has a question, and uh, I'll start with you, Attorney General, but uh, our other panelists may have views. It's really about the cost of pharmaceuticals in all of this. Um, Lois notes that some have become extraordinarily expensive. Uh, Thoughts on that? Yeah, well, that's why we sued Eli Lilly and made them provide $35 insulin for everybody in Minnesota, not just seniors. So that's the law now. We still got a couple of others to deal with. Uh, There's two other manufacturers. We also joined a multi-state litigation against generic drug manufacturers because of illegal collusion. Some folks in, in, in connection with this case have gone to jail, but this case is winding its way through. It is a primary uh, priority for us to reduce uh, pres- the cost of prescription drugs in Minnesota. And uh, that is what we're going to do. Right now, we're you know, trying to defend the Alex Smith Emergency uh, Act. Uh, this is an act that provides free insulin for low-income people who need it. That that it, But we are in intense litigation there, so we'll see where that goes. But we're committed to it. I mean, at the end of the day, our parents grew up in a land of opportunity, intergenerational um, 
prosperity was something that anybody could aspire to. Today, our economy has stagnated. People are stuck in the circumstances they've been in, and we got to unstick it by bringing real regulation to the market, deconcentrating these markets. Jen was talking about Mm -hmm. hospital mergers, very big deal. And so we got some new authority last year to examine hospital transactions, including mergers, for their effect on the public interest. And so this is something that we've all got to do, and it's a, we need everybody's help. Thank you. Jennifer, your views on, pharma- on pharmaceutical prices, because it, it can be complex. A generic insulin uh, that has been long developed on the market is one thing, but some stuff for deadly diseases cost a lot to develop. Yeah, anything for rare diseases uh, cost a lot. And, you know, I have uh, folks in my district that they have Parkinson's. Those drugs are thousands and thousands of dollars, and they pay that every month. Mm -hmm. They may have to declare bankruptcy because they can't afford their medication for Parkinson's. And uh, cancer drugs are very expensive. Drugs for arthritis are very expensive. And as a country, we pay the highest prices for brand name drugs in the world. And I'm very um, glad that at the federal level, they followed Minnesota on insulin for capping insulin for Medicare beneficiaries. They need to do that for everybody. It is, but it's not just insulin. Mm-hmm. So Medicare now is in the process of negotiating 10 drugs. Medicare should be able to negotiate all drugs, just like the VA system. We need to get to that point. And new this year, Medicare beneficiaries will not pay more than $2,000 out of pocket for prescription drugs per year. That is a huge win. You need to tell everybody about that. And, you know, and hopefully you'll be hearing more about uh, what the current president is working on to reduce our health care spending and make sure that everyone gets the care that they need when they need it. But prescription drugs, uh, there's a lot of work we need to do, and I'm hearing from a lot of people throughout the country that they just can't afford them anymore. Can I ask a question, Dan? Yeah. I'm so, so, Jen, you know, yeah, these drugs cost a lot of money, but isn't it also true that we subsidize them as the taxpayer pretty heavily as well? Well, here's the, here's the fact. Most of the research, research and development on drugs is done at our R1 academic institutions that are paid for with uh, NIH money that is paid for by our taxpayers. So we are we are funding the research, and I know that um, the administration mentioned using March in rights, meaning taking over patents for drugs where the research was done at these academic institutions. I don't know if that will happen. That's controversial, but we are paying for a lot of the research, and we just have to make sure pharmaceutical companies are being accountable for charging reasonable prices. And when we go into stem cell, uh, stem cell therapy and uh, gene therapy, those can be hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to get cell therapy. And are we going to deny people that, that can cure these rare diseases because they can't afford it? This is a big question of what we think is ethical and what, you know, we... we we just can't let people not get the care. It's there because they can't afford it. We have to talk about this as society, about how we're going to fund this. But I mean, forward. I should point out that it's not like the pharmaceutical companies don't put any money in. Sometimes they do put big money in. And the failure rate is like most drugs don't work. It's like one in a hundred, according to industry f- figures. But it still sets wrong. I've seen the polls with Americans that how come the same drug is so much cheaper if you went, took a plane flight to Toronto or something. Right, because the marginal cost of producing the drug once you have the patent or once you have something that's effective is very small. It's very small. So they have to recoup the costs, uh, the initial costs of the uh, development, but they're making excessive profits, pharmaceutical companies. So that's what really needs Allison, to be addressed. Allison, I can see you're yeah. ready to roll. Well, I, I, just, I just think about the connection between your talk. I always think back to the patient, right, the person that's trying to get the access to care. And I think people end up staying in jobs that they don't, you know, they don't move. Like it affects the economy, right, because they're holding on to their insurance because they can't b- live life without access to that drug. So I think it has these other effects that I, mm-hmm. I think we have to put on the table and be conscious of. There's a lot of people that 
aren't able to leave their jobs, that aren't able to be mobile, that stick in, in the same place and make different choices about their, you know, upward mobility based on that, holding on to that insurance just so that they can have access to care, be it pharmaceuticals or, or otherwise. I have an interesting follow-up question. I apologize about pronunciation. Um, che Yu, perhaps? Um, with a name like Brancaccio, I should know how to say your name. I'm sorry. Um, it's about a new drug that's all the rage, a class of drugs. What do you think will be the impact on medical debt of GLP-1 drugs? But, I mean, that's, you know, people think of it as, like, Ozempic. The weight loss drugs that are seem very effective but uh, are expensive. Jennifer? Well, if we can reduce the price, I think, and we reduce obesity, that can save in the long run uh, medical costs. So we have to think about what, what the long run savings will be. And the government doesn't budget in long runs. It doesn't look at the savings over uh, 10 or 30 years. But um, in the long run, it could lead to actually reducing health care costs. But yes, the price is high, and that's what we have to address. Julie has a question. Uh, it's quite practical. It's maybe one of the m more important practical questions that we probably can weigh in on here and probably again as the evening goes on. Are there free financial resources that Minnesota residents can access if they open up one of these bills and they know they cannot handle it? You're like, where does someone start with yes. a question like that? Well, well, let me. One of the things I want to suggest to folks is that the Minnesota Attorney General's Office has a wonderful group called a Consumer Action Group. And if you get a bill and you're like, what am I going to do with this? Please give us a call at 651-296-3353, 651-296-3353. And we will try to help you with that. We'll help guide you to resources that can maybe help you cover some of these bills and get some help. Um, so the resources are out there. They're not comprehensive. They don't cover everything. And they're not always easy to find. But if you call us, we will help try to guide you to a place where you can get some help. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, I would just say everyone should also realize that they should go to the hospital or the provider and ask about financial assistance. Tell your story, it, what, whoever it is, just make sure you have that conversation. It's, again, unfortunate. It shouldn't have to be this way, but it is this way, and it does make a difference if you call. They have the ability to give financial assistance, to lower your bill. You know, you can go back to your insurance company as well. It takes time. It's exhausting, but it's important to do. And there's groups. There's another group called Dollar Four that you can call that they provide help with navigation through the financial assistance process at hospitals. So there are resources out there, and I definitely Whatever you do, don't put it on a credit card. That that is a really bad move because it also also doesn't have the same protections. Um, which like like this bill that he's talking about that he's doing. Once you put it on a credit card, it's consumer debt. It's not medical debt That's anymore. Right. So all the all the protections he's putting That's in right. place will not not apply. That's so right. don't put it on a credit card. Um, and also be really mindful of signing up for, you know, this great plan that the hospital is telling you to sign up for that has either a high interest rate or you can't afford the monthly bill, bills on. So really try to negotiate it down to something that's affordable and definitely don't like not pay your rent or other bills because you have a medical debt. Like I would definitely pay those more important things first because that's going to keep you going. It's just more important to pay those things. And I, I want people to have that message. And they also shouldn't sign consent forms when they're in the hospital uh, before they get care. Get the care. You'll get the care you know, even if you don't sign the consent you don't. You form. have a choice? Yes, you do have a choice because you, when you sign some consent forms, you're basically saying, I'm going to pay everything. I'm going to pay the bills. So you have to be careful of what forms you sign when you're, depending on what state you're in, um, what forms you sign that you, what you're, and what, what you're if signing for What the person at the hospital liability. says, we're not going to let you get care if you don't sign here? If it's an emergency situation, they have to provide care. So They have to provide mm -hmm. care. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Very, very Pro interesting. Pro tip. Yeah. Yeah. Pro tip right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, um, so uh, our colleagues over at Consumer Reports, they also do very good work. They're a nonprofit. Um, they have this uh, uh, list of bad moments in medical debt. And uh, I saw a case, and I think this is California, Keith, but I'm curious what your reaction would be Would it had it happened in Minnesota. Um, guy uh, goes into... Uh, ER with a COVID complication, and they hand him the forms for the medical credit card. Hmm. 
and they never check to see if he's eligible for the charitable care. That's sort of not part of the process. Problem. Is that a problem right there? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we're really concerned about is people being steered away from the charity care that they should be receiving. I mean, look, hospitals in Minnesota, for the most part, are, 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 are nonprofits, right? They, they, get, they get tax advantages so that they can do certain things to people for, in the public interest, and they should do them. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it, this, this, I think, is a big concern. And I think you were talking about how when you all buy this medical debt, you find a lot of people who were eligible for charity care but who were steered in the other direction. I mean, I don't know that they were steered. I have to say, when, when by the time we look at the, the medical debt, there's there's certain situations. I think it's probably a fair amount of them that people's financial situation is also different and has deteriorated because of a, a medical moment. So, about, and the, what the hospitals don't do because they have no incentive to do it is go back and look, right? So, like when you walk in the hospital, you're one financial state. Three years later, you, you know, you didn't pay this bill because your health deteriorated, et cetera. Your financial state is different. And so now you're eligible for charity care. They don't take a fresh look. The other thing that I think is important that hospitals should be required to do is actually notify people when they get charity care, which is not the case. So they may give them technically charity care. But if you don't notify the patient that you've done that, then they think they still owe, owe this money because they went and got the services and they won't show up the next time when they have another episode or have another incident and need to get the medical care. They think they still owe this bill. And it has a mental health impact on them as That's well. Right. It feels like the weight of the world is on their shoulders. And we know because when we lift that weight through our work, mm -hmm. they are like just overjoyed and feel like it's overwhelming relief. So... Um, I just want to say that's another element of it is hospitals need to be notifying people when they do actually decide to give someone charity care. But may, may, may I add? I'm sorry, Jen. Hospitals that are nonprofit get a huge tax exemption. And there was a recent study that shows that, that val it's valued at about $28 billion dollars. Of, of tax exemption status. And hospitals are only reporting less than half that in charity care. But that charity care, how that's defined matters because it's not uncompensated care necessarily. So they're, they're by the IRS in 1969, they uh, made it easier, changed the definition of what charity care is. It doesn't mean they're giving free care. It means that they have to make sure they're improving the health in their community. And the biggest uh, piece of that charity care that hospitals report to validate their, to keep their tax exemption status is the difference between what Medicaid reimburses and what they charge. So they can charge a lot for services and whatever Medicaid reimburses, they take the difference and they count that as charity care. States are going after this. Many states are putting more definition on what they have to provide in terms of uncompensated real charity care. Um, but at the federal level, this need, we need to go back to the original intent of what the IRS said if we give you tax exemption status. Gina on Zoom wants us to talk to you a little bit more, Allison, about the process. Like, oh, how do you get into your system and how do you decide? <laughs> uh, how yeah. does it work? Yeah, so so you you can apply, you cannot apply. Just to be clear, um, it is it's kind of like you you know winning the lotto without buying a lottery ticket. Um, you, what happens is we go to healthcare providers, and we've only been actually working directly with healthcare providers since 2021. Before that, we bought it from what's called the secondary market. So for-profit debt collectors that bought the debt already from the hospitals. And we still do buy some of that debt, but we've been increasingly trying to work directly with hospitals for a variety of reasons, including being able to give them feedback on how their financial assistance policies are actually panning out, which I think is an important outcome with the hope that they will, um, and, and with some influence, change some of those policies in a way that catches more people. So um, what we do is we get a, a, we actually have this, proprietary debt engine that we created. We have a team of engineers who actually built this debt engine um, that is very efficient, which is why we can do this for, for pretty inexpensive with a relatively small team. And so we get a d bad debt file from the hospital and we, we sign like um, business associates agreements and things like that so we can be HIPAA compliant. We get that file. 
We run it through our debt engine. We identify all of the people that are 400% of poverty or below, or again, a debt is 5% or more of their income. And we do that by buying data from FinThrive, which was formerly TransUnion Healthcare. Um, once we have those people, once we identify all those people, it's usually a very high percentage of the file that we get. we put the pricing uh, associated with each debt. The pricing is based on the for-profit market, which is basically pennies on the dollar. So it's less than a penny for like a, a debt that's like two years old or, or, or mm. younger. Um, and it goes, and the, the older the debt, the cheaper it is. And that's how the market works. So that's what we apply. And then we send a final number to the hospital and say like, we'll, you know, we'll pay this much money based on our analysis for all these debts. And then we wire them the money. We sign paperwork where we own the debt. And then we send out letters to all the people and let them know that we've bought their debt and that they never have to owe that debt again. But you are saying a robot or an algorithm is the one that uh, has the magic wand. It is. I mean, it's. It's. I mean, it's. It's very simple. I mean, it's. It's. It's based on their 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 income level, and there's no other um, way of looking at it. Everyone that's in that file that qualifies, we buy the debt for. Like even if here, for example, here in in St. Paul, we're um, we've got a contract that we're going to be entering very soon, and the funding will focus on the St. Paul residents. But when we get a hospital file, there will be some residents that are in St. Paul, and we'll apply those dollars to to the St. Paul residents. But we will buy the people that are don't live in St. Paul, say they were visiting here and, you know, we'll, we'll apply our own privately fundraised dollars to those people as well. So we will buy the entire file and uh, um, uh, make sure that we relieve all of the debts once we get our hands on them. Is, is this in connection with the uh, program that Mayor Carter yes, helped lead correct. to buy the medical that debt us, of yes. St. Paul residents? Now, see, look, you got mayors consensitive to this problem because it's going on all over the place. Isn't that right? That's right. It's, yeah. we ha we're doing this across the country. Yeah, yeah. Other cities? Yeah, we've got, we're working with New York City. We were, Cook County was the first one to do this. Toledo, New Orleans, uh, a lot of places in Ohio. I mean, so we're, we're all over the place. I'm, I'm glad you're there to help them, but it does give you a sense of scale. You know, when you yeah. were talking about 220 yeah. uh Billion. Billion. Billion dollars, you know, and, you know, uh, some enormous numbers of Americans dealing with this. No, it's fascinating. So it's so counties, municipalities, states. states we just signed too. Arizona just uh, went in for 20 million dollars of worth mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of for a contract with us to do uh, debt relief. Connecticut is, is doing it as well. And uh, New Jersey, there's several places. Do people believe the letters? <laughs> What did you, they did you do. Them? They do. It's a, it's a good question. Um, they do. I think what happens is at first they're like disbelieve it, and they're and then they look us up, and then you know, I mean, we hear back from them. They, they're then they just have tears of joy, like the people are just overwhelmed with uh, appreciation. And look, we're not. We're not creating complete miracles for people. I mean, these these are individuals who have a lot of other unrelated to healthcare debts, you know, or other other things. But to remove this debt so easily, I think, really helps propel people forward and give them a, an, an opportunity to feel good about going back to the healthcare provider. I think that's the biggest takeaway for us. Increasingly, thanks to a lot of changes, the impact on credit is lessening, right? So there's been some important changes um, at the federal level that are actually reducing how much this is impacting people's credit, which is great, but it does still impact people's willingness to go back to the ho hospital or to get the care that they need in the first place. And so when we get, get when they get these letters, they do uh, tell us that they that they feel very good about going back to the doctor and getting the care. Just they need. Just another minute in this section, but Jennifer, I, I, you may be thinking, I don't know, I'm trying to channel you. Um, this is wonderful, but let's not forget what we said earlier, and actually what Allison said earlier, which is maybe the debt itself shouldn't be there. And you just wrote in the paper yesterday, it was an opinion piece, about what's called the public option. Would that, you didn't specifically link that to medical debt, but is it relevant to the medical it debt? It is relevant. So there's a bill moving through the Minnesota State Legislature allowing people to buy into the Minnesota Care Coverage Option, which is very extensive coverage, very affordable, very low deductible, and your premium would be based on your income. And people who would be eligible, if you have employer-sponsored insurance, you would not yet be eligible, but it would be affordable coverage. And so if you had this coverage, your bills would be paid and it would um, hopefully not lead to medical debt. But So you'd expand eligibility, but who pays? It's taxpayers that pay? 
Well, we would use federal money. There would be a waiver that wouldn't be needed uh, from the federal government to um, help subsidize the lower premiums. But if you're income, you know, if you're uh, towards the higher income scale, you be you would be paying the full premium. But even that is more affordable. It allows more competition among um, health insurance products on the individual market. Um, and it's getting people access to care, but you know, that's because, you know, paying the medical debt is wonderful, but that's the band aid. We need to make sure we have low prices and more complete coverage and not have under insurance because once, I mean, you pay that medical debt, you're right. They still may have medical needs and they may accumulate more debt in the future. So it is a band aid, but hospitals right now, clinics are denying care. If you have debt at their clinic or hospital. They will not sometimes see the patient, and that is a problem. Which brings us to marketplace swag. (laughs) Um, Do the quiz, QR code, or if you're online, if you're just joining us, uh, marketplace.org forward slash, the one, I don't know, I can't do it this way, that way, Um, health wealth, and take this quiz, you're not graded, and then we'll do a drawing over the next 24 hours for the bags of the swag. Let us give a big round of applause to the whole panel, but especially Attorney General Keith Ellison.